Welcome to You Are From God, where we open God's Word to discover His image in ourselves and the people around us. I'm Scott Taylor. And I'm Tyler Hall. Thanks for joining us today. So recently, Scott, I was watching this television show, and there's an interesting interaction between an adult man and his mother. He goes back to her house, and he's going to be staying with her for a while. And you can tell by the interaction in the show that there's some tension there. Uh, and the, the mom's not afraid to bring it up, and the son's a little begrudgingly kind of addressing these things. And at some point, the son explains to his mom, look, you could have always called me up and stayed with me. Uh, and the mom said something interesting that's kind of been uh, pulling at the back of my mind for a while since I've seen this show. She said, any civilized being knows an open invitation is no invitation at all. And I thought that was a pretty powerful line, just from the standpoint of kind of underscoring the tension and the bitterness and resentment you just see in this obviously fictitious relationship between a, a son and his mother. But it got me thinking a little bit, you know, how we want to be good people. We strive to help other people, do good, be kind to other people. But I think a lot of times it is based on our convenience and what's easiest or best for me. You know, I'm happy to help if someone comes and approaches me with the opportunity or if it fits into my schedule. But, you know, I'm happy to give an open invitation. Come over anytime. Do this. And and we say those types of things, which certainly could be true. But I wonder if sometimes, at least for me, speaking for myself, if I don't just do that as a quick coverall. And then if it comes to actually fulfilling those things, I take a step back and say, well, wait, what does that look like? And so it kind of leads into our discussion today. What does it look like to actually give those kind of genuine invitations to help, to to serve here in the context of hospitality, to really love strangers or open up your home to even your family or to loved ones, to members of the church? But going beyond that, just putting our own rights and privileges and resources down for the betterment and the uplifting of other people. And as we'll see, this ultimately comes down to the greatest example in the scriptures we could find of truly caring and serving others. It's amazing to think about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came to serve. And the opportunity that we have to follow that example, and to your point, sometimes that can be very difficult. Sometimes we struggle viewing ourselves to be servants um, when the reality is that's what we've been called to be Mm -hmm. as his children. I I think of John, the 13th chapter, this whole situation is fascinating to me when you're talking about the last few days of our Savior's life prior to his crucifixion. And he's focusing on other people. He, He comes into Jerusalem with fanfare. You know, people are young, Hosanna, and there's just a lot of excitement that's going on. And then he goes and he clears out the temple um, around this time. And then he comes back and he offers the Lord's Supper in particular in John the 13th chapter, institutes it, telling them what they needed to do. And then, Tyler, he does something that only the lowliest of low servants would have done in a household, which is wash their feet. And he ends there. We all be like, Peter, don't you're not touching me. You're not washing my feet. You're the you're Christ. You're not touching my feet. And so Jesus and him have this conversation about whether or not he was going to be a part of him. But it's fascinating that he ends by saying, go and do likewise. The idea of understanding that if you're going to follow and serve God, it comes at the service of others. It comes to you living the life as Jesus did. Nobody had a better reason to have people serve him than Jesus. He is the son of God. He is the creator. You know, that makes sense that people would be serving him. But as he showed us the idea of how we show our love to God, certainly in an obedience to him, but a lot of times, as First John will get into, it's with how we treat our neighbors, how we treat other people. And it's it's so powerful to think that the greatest example of that is the one that created us. And it... And for a situation, even just from human standards, what Jesus would have been going through in John 13, outside of, you know, the observance of the Passover, he knows that this is his last few hours as a free man, a last few hours uh, of, of until he's crucified. And so you think about all the things, if we, if you or I or any of us knew that that was imminent for us in the coming hours, what would have been on our mind, how we would have been focused, certainly the tendency would be on ourselves. And Jesus is taking this time to 
serve and to pour into these men. At the beginning of the chapter uh, in verse 1 of John 13 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, that lowliest position. And you just think like Jesus knew. He knew what was going on with Judas. He knew what the plan was leading up to this point. All the different things that very much would be from a human standpoint about turning inward and preserving self, defending self, feeling embittered and betrayed. But Jesus even washes the feet of Judas, which is just amazing to even think about what that interaction would have looked like, would have felt like on either side. But you just look at that illustration that Jesus gives for us, and it's amazing to see how we are called to be like him, how we are to think of others first, how we can put aside those cares and concerns that we do have and truly just be there for other people and to put others' needs ahead of our own. And This doesn't just happen naturally, Scott. This is something that as we put on Christ, as we're walking in the Lord, we have to renew our minds, as the scriptures will talk about. We have to think like a servant. We have to have a mind like Christ. And so part of that comes with just understanding what an opportunity to serve even looks like. There's this phrase in the scriptures that talks about opportunities as open doors. A good example is 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. Uh, where Paul says, a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. I've always found that fascinating. Okay, so Paul says, there's this wide door open for effective work. I can really do some good here for the Lord to spread the kingdom, and there are many adversaries. Well, that doesn't sound like a wide open door. It sounds like a door that's locked and padlocked and it's got deadbolts on it like that. (laughs) You should probably leave, Paul. And so some of it is looking at situations, not, is this comfortable for me? Is this about my ease? How easy can I make this for me to serve another person? But how can I go literally out of my way in some instances to show love, to show care and compassion on people who need that and who need to know the Lord? So part of the battle is just opening our eyes, having the mindset to look for those opportunities, and then it takes it to the next step which is going from just thinking about it to acting on it well it's it's amazing to think about the question that was asked of jesus in luke the 10th chapter when he was asked who is my neighbor to that point sometimes you have to be willing to look all the time you have to be willing to look past the one in the mirror you know that's our uh, favorite subject when my son was little he would call this world jacob world <laughs> you know can and the reality is i think we all could be in that situation uh, from time to time that of how we look at this world but the interesting piece to me to that point, he talking about the doors and the Good Samaritan story that Jesus tells is that he uses the word by chance. There was a by chance, a priest walked by the Levite walked by and saw the man and went to the other side there. There were these opportunities there and they just saw stumbling blocks. They saw perhaps if you wanted to get into it, um, they saw somebody that was unclean, somebody that was um, maybe not beaten up for doing nothing, but just, you know, was a homeless person and and good for nothing and didn't want to have anything to do with them and certainly didn't feel compassion on them. But the Samaritan saw the man for what he is. He was a man who was in need. And uh, instead of just going by, don't have time, whatever the excuses are, stopped and took advantage of the situation or took the opportunity to help the man and quite frankly to the point that you were making went out of his way Mm -hmm. to help the man and that's what i think so valuable about stories like the good samaritan or or looking at the doors and so often we see the obstacle so often we see the enemies We we see the things that may stop us rather than the actual door that is open there and the opportunity that is there to help us. That's that's where people are going to see Jesus when we're acting differently than the world. And that's the reality of this situation, even though in Luke, the 10th chapter, he's mentioning religious people from the standpoint of Levites or priests didn't mean anything that they were living it or treating people the way that they needed to treat them. There's never missed the point that he uses the Samaritan to make the actual point of the neighbor. Right. It's it's a powerful, powerful lesson for all of us. 
to stop walking through this life as though nothing is going on around us and see the opportunities rather than just the obstacles. Tyler, I always use traffic as the example, or if I'm in line at a grocery store, the people in front of me are obstacles. I don't view them to be opportunities, mm-hmm. and, I, and I need to change the way that I view people. God views them... Uh, loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them and wants to have a relationship with them. And I need to view people through those eyes as our God does and look for those opportunities to serve them and to bring glory to God and that they can have a relationship with him as well. Yeah. And if that's the God that I have a relationship with, that's going to show in the way that he's changing my heart to look at people that way. That if I'm a disciple of Jesus, if I'm following the Lord Christ, then I'm going to behave as he did, yes, even with my enemies, yes, even with these people who are turning their heel up against me, with these people who don't understand or might not appreciate my service. It's not about getting something in return. It's about expressing love, not because there's an equation that needs to be balanced, but because God's already filled my cup and it overflows. That's how we have to view this. And that's what First John, as you mentioned earlier, will talk about in chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, that he kind of summarizes a lot of what he's talked about in this letter pretty beautifully here. He says, By this we know love, that he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. It's it goes back to that illustration. You could have come over any time. I I had this idea to open up my home to you, mom. <laughs> but that's a an idea and there was no there was no follow through. There was no action behind it. And so obviously this goes into whatever situation you might find yourself or as you're looking for opportunities to serve other people. It's one thing to love in word or in talk. Certainly that's needed. Words can communicate love very well. But what if God just said, I love you so much? He He demonstrated it. God loved the world in this way, that he sent his only son. And this is what it gets down to when it says you need to go beyond love from wording, from words and talking to deeds and in truth. That's real love that is demonstrated and acted out and proven by those actions. James says something similar over in James 2, 15 and 16. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? And he talks about the application with faith. Faith is going to be in doing something. And so that includes our love and service for our fellow image bearers, those who are around us, who Uh, might be of the household of God, might be people that are involved with our lives who need to know God better, that they need to come to him to be part of his family, the people we don't even know, or that we might even have reason to be hostile against from a worldly perspective. But Jesus gives us this awesome example. He laid his life down for us. We need to have this perspective of how can I put myself in this position to give? You know, anytime, Scott, we go into a new setting, whether we're walking into our homes after a long day of work or whether we're going into that grocery store or uh, coming into a public venue to participate in something or watch something, a lot of the times there's selfish motivations there. This is what I plan to do. This is what I need. This is, this is about me. And, And let me be clear, one of those public venues that this can be creeping into is when we come into worship, which is the wrong attitude to have. Um, but that whole concept of when I walk into a room, what can I get from this situation is oftentimes what our natural or earthly tendencies tend to be. Jesus is teaching us through all of these examples and all of these commandments through his scriptures that we need to go into the room and see those souls, to your point, not as obstacles, but how can I serve here? How can I go again out of my way to lift somebody up in this situation? It behooves us to look for those opportunities to serve, to to exercise that service muscle in the name and in the glory of Jesus. However, we also need to understand that the, we're a Christian. God's also called us into a family where we need to lean on one another and realize you don't have to be a superhuman that takes care of everything and that you don't need other people. We do need each other. 
there's these verses in the scriptures that just simply say, look, if you're in need of help, tell somebody. James 5.14 says, is anyone sick? Call for the elders. Well, what? The elders should just know if I'm sick and do something. That That's a real mindset that I've been guilty of in the past, and I know other people have been. Well, so-and-so, they know my situation. They should just they should just do something without me asking. That's a really dangerous game to play, so to speak. And so the Bible will say you need to call for these people. If, if you're in need of help, some of the times those situations are only known as if you speak up and talk to people. And again, in the family of God, people want to serve, and there is going to be this positive reaction to helping in the best way possible. And then I go back to John 13, as Jesus is ending there with Peter in verse 20, he says something interesting to him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. I think sometimes, Scott, even Christians, we can get very prideful about being served, about being helped. I I, I don't want to accept any charity. I don't want to accept these things and seem weak or needy in any way. Well, that's not the calling of a Christian. There's going to be times where I'm serving other people in my abundance and their need, and there's going to be times when I'm in need and they have an opportunity to go out of their way to help me. And Jesus is making the promise here in verse 20, if you're receiving the one that I'm sending, if they're laboring as for the Lord to serve you, it's like you're receiving me. So do you really want to reject Jesus at the door? That's something to think about on that other end when we're accepting of the service of a brother or sister in Christ. Yeah, it's, it's easy to see somebody, when we're talking about the Good Samaritan, when they're getting beat up and you mm-hmm. see them. It's difficult when everybody walks into the building as though everything is fine. And one of the dangerous things, Tyler, that we do is that we just view everybody else as though their life is perfect. I'm the one that's struggling. We all have times of struggle. We all need to put down, as you said, the pride and, and truly just be like our Savior as we're told to be. Philippians, the second chapter, what an amazing chapter this is. It basically just tells us the, just that. Be like Jesus. Verse 5 says, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And it continues on beautifully, but just the idea that he became like a bond servant. It came a bond servant. He became an us, you know, and, and sometimes Tyler, we think so highly of ourselves and, and Jesus humbled himself to become like us, to be obedient unto the point of death, even the death on the cross for you and for me. What an amazing example he is for um, being a servant, love, being a neighbor, whatever the subject is. He is the awesome example of it. And if we're going to follow him and be like him, we need to make sure that we're doing all we can to let people see him in us. Because it is amazing to be able to say you are from God. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this program. Be sure to subscribe on your platform of choice so you never miss an episode. Would you do us a favor and recommend this program to someone you know? We pray this simple act of sharing can encourage both of you in the faith and open up doors for meaningful and Christ-centered conversation. You can find us at youarefromgod.com. Click the connect button at the top of the page if you'd like to send us a question, give us feedback, or offer a suggestion for an episode. Catch up on previous episodes, find the year-long devotional, and more by visiting youarefromgod.com.